this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. If you are awake this morning, praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning to Jesus House Dallas. Jesus House is a member of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. And if this is your first time worshiping with us, I want you to know that we are especially honored that you could make it this morning. We want you to know how excited we are that you are here. I believe that God has a plan for your life. I believe that God has a word for you. Amen. Amen. Today is a, is a special service. We have a packed service this morning. We've got a couple of baby dedications and a thanksgiving. Amen. But I promise the service will not run over too much. Amen. Five minutes max. I promise. I give you my word. Amen. So we're in, we are, we are in the second week of a Bible study series that is called The Story. And our goal with this series is that we get a deeper understanding of God. The Bible says, they that know their God. Don't you know? We say, they that know their God. It is those people, the people who know God, that will be strong and that will do exploits, that will do great things. Our ability to do great things, the Bible is telling us, is contingent upon our knowledge of God. The more of God we know, the more powerful we are. The more of God we know, the greater our potential to do great and mighty things. Amen? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. And that is why we're doing the story. We're trying to get to know God better. God's plan from the beginning of time was to have a relationship with us. God made man and gave him all the resources that he needed to thrive. And God planned when he created the heavens and the earth. God planned that man would live in community, that man would live in fellowship, that man would live in relationship with him. But when Adam ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he put a wrinkle in that plan. He, 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 he messed up the plan, as it were, and God had to kick him out of the Garden of Eden. Because of that first act of disobedience, sin was coded into the nature of mankind. Amen? Amen. Death and corruption and sickness and disease and earthquakes and, and hurricanes and, and serial killers and, and, and fundamentalist madmen entered into creation. But not only did all of these horrible things become a part of, of, of nature and life, God was now separate from man. God could no longer have fellowship with man because the Bible says that God is too holy. He's too righteous to behold iniquity. God and evil cannot reside together. But the good news, and I have good news this morning, the good news is that from that point, from the point when Adam sinned and was kicked out of the garden, from that point on, God began a new plan. And the new plan was how do I bring these people back to me? How do I reconcile these people? How do I bring myself back into fellowship, into relationship with these people? That is why the Bible says things like, God has given to Jesus Christ the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. A peacemaker is not somebody who goes around settling quarrel. Amen? A peacemaker is somebody who makes peace between mankind and God. Amen? Amen. Last week, we, we looked at the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And uh, today, as the story continues, we're going to look at the next phase of God's plan. Let me start by asking us a question. Have you ever had a season in your life where on the outside everything looked great? But on the inside, you kind of felt like you were stagnating. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's as if everything is on pause. Things seem to either be heading in the wrong direction or heading in no direction. You are not where you thought you would be at this stage of your life. By now, you thought certain things would have been settled. Amen? By now, you thought you'd be married. 
By now you thought you'd be done having children. By now you thought you would, you know, you'd be the director of a Fortune 500. Amen. By now you thought you'd be the CEO of a, of a, of a tech startup. By now you thought you would have your first million dollars. By now you thought you would have paid off all your school loans. By now you thought you would be a U.S. citizen. By now you thought this would have been done. By now you thought that would have been done. Alas. <laughs> You've prayed to God. You have fasted. You have tithed. You have given. You've given until it hurt. Breakthrough offering, overnight offering, turn around offering, my miracle now offering. You've given it all, but the prayers seem to have gone unanswered. But you want to believe that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. But you find yourself asking this question How can I know? How am I sure? that all of these things that I am trusting God for will come to pass. Then, then today's story is for you. Today's sermon is for you. Hallelujah. And what we start to see is the unfolding of God's plan. What we're going to see is the unfolding of God's plan to reconcile us back to himself, to draw us back to himself. And the first step in the execution of that plan is the nation of Israel. Every journey starts with one step. Amen? And every nation starts with one man. Turn with me to Genesis, the 12th chapter. And we'll read from verse 1. And this is our first introduction to a man called Abram. And the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Turn to your neighbor and say, Great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old. Turn to was 75 years old. <laughs> Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. At, at this point of this first interaction with God, Abraham is 75 years old. 75. I know some of us cannot comprehend the implications of a 75-year-old man. I was telling them in the first service that I'm 48 years old. So I, you know, I, I know that there's a difference between 48 and 25. Amen? I, I, I feel it every day in my body. You know, you know, sometimes you wake up in the morning. You know how they say that age is just a number is in your mind? It's a lie. <laughs> Amen. It's a big lie. In fact, this morning, I was reminded that it was a lie. You know, I, I woke up in the morning, and I'm feeling all young and energetic. You know, feeling really youthful. And I tried to dash out of bed. And my knee said, whoa. <laughs> my, my, my knee said to me, respect yourself. Where are you dashing to? Climb out of bed. <laughs> Amen? Because if I had continued in that youthful dash, my knee would not have followed me. And I would have found myself lying face down on the floor, asking for my wife to come and help me. Hallelujah. But Abraham is 75 years old. And God says to him at 75, come and leave everything you know, everything you're comfortable with, and I'm going to take you on a journey. 75-year-old people don't go on those kinds of journeys. I'm going to take you on a journey to some place you don't know. And, and through you, I am going to build a nation at 75. A nation at 75. Is that a joke? But you know what? Remember, we said one of the reasons why we're doing this is that so that we can understand God better. 
And this is one of the things you must know about God. He uses the most unlikely people to accomplish his purposes. Abraham and his wife Sarah were way past retirement age. If they lived in America, they would be members of AARP. They would be on social security. Most likely in the nursing home. Amen? Have credit at Walgreens for the plenty prescriptions that they would be on. They're not going anywhere. And, and, and to, to add to that, Sarah never given birth. Never had a child. I mean, you would expect that if you are going to build a nation, you would choose somebody who had a track record of um, fertility and production. Amen? Abraham's father was an idol maker. I mean, surely God could have found somebody more qualified, someone younger, somebody more fertile. But this is the man that God chooses. If you had heard God's plan and God said to you, choose a man, you would never have chosen Abraham. But God chose Abraham. Listen to me. If anybody has ever told you that you were not qualified or you're not eligible, remind them of Abraham. Remind them that your God does not judge as man judges. He does not see as man sees. They may have put you aside. But God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he will use you to advance his kingdom. You know, in Hebrews 11 verse 8, we, we get a clue as to what God was looking for. It says, by faith, Abraham, when, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he obeyed. That is why. God is not looking for people who are qualified. He's looking for people who have faith and who will obey. And because Abraham had faith and because Abraham obeyed, God chose him. Now, you would expect that since God chose him, all his troubles would go away. And that is what we tell people. If God chooses you, all your troubles will be over and you will live happily ever after. Give your life to Jesus and you will get that White, that big house with the white picket fence. Two and a half, two children, no, 2.5 children. And one golden Labrador. But that's not what happened. In fact, the opposite is what happened. Abraham and Sarah experienced farming. No food. Animals that they had invested money buying died. They had to move over and over again. They got separated from, from family members that they loved and that had traveled with them. That's the same thing that happened to David, you know. David was anointed as king. You know, we tend to think of the anointing as something that chases away our problems. So we seek the anointing. When they call anointing service, once we see that bottle of oil, the way we rush to the front is unbelievable. Oh, please, pastor, anoint me. David's problems started after he was anointed. I'm sure David said, why, why, why? Leave me. After he was anointed, he moved out of his father's house, started living in caves. After he was anointed, he became a fugitive. All of a sudden, the king wants to kill him. Be careful with the anointing. It's like a fragrant oil that sometimes attracts flies. Demonic flies, <laughs> like Saul. <laughs> Amen. You know, they, they, they went through so much trouble. But you know what? The hardest thing that they experienced was when they experienced nothing. Nothing. God had promised them a child. And 24 years later, nothing. 
no miscarriages, just no pregnancy, nothing. You know, maybe somebody here knows how they felt. Maybe you're still waiting for an answer to your prayer. <laughs> but I'm sure nobody here has been waiting 24 years. We're not talking about 24 days. You know, we have to wait 24 days and we freak out. Say, God, where are you? Pastor Femi, it's not true. 24 weeks. Oh, no, no, they're not coming to church anymore. You won't see them in church anymore. 24 months. <laughs> they are the club, man. <laughs> I mean, seriously, though, who would blame Abraham if after 24 years he did not have any more faith in this God who after 24 years had not yet fulfilled his promise? Who would blame him? But look at what the Bible says in Romans 4. Verse 18. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Against all hope, in hope, he believed. And so, because he became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. The Bible tells us that Abraham did, not, Abraham did not waver in his faith. Get this, he was even strengthened by what he went through. I mean, who is this guy? How do you, after waiting for 24 years, how do you still have faith? And I'm sure as we're, we're thinking that we're saying, well, there must be a reason. It's not normal. I mean, maybe he was some kind of super Christian. No, he wasn't a Christian. He was a Jew. Christ hadn't come. Well, maybe he grew up in a perfect home. No, his dad was an idol maker, and he lived in a land that worshipped false, false gods. Maybe, he, you know, he had a good fusion group. He had a great support system. You know, very supportive friends who would hold his hand in prayer, and they would stand together on the word of God and pray the matter through. <laughs> it's not likely. The guy was always moving around. He wasn't very stable. And in those days anyway, you know, if you, had, if you didn't have children, nobody wanted to be around you because it was considered punishment. That means that you are cursed, and nobody wants to hang around people who are cursed because, I don't know, they thought curses were contagious. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> My wife and I, you know, no matter how angry we get in our house, we never say God punish you. <laughs> I, I don't know how you say to your husband or your wife, God punish you, because how does God punish them? And the punishments, <laughs> I mean, if God punishes them with sickness, you are the one taking them to hospital. If he punishes them with poverty. <laughs> so, please, just an aside, husbands and wife, if you are mad at your spouse, say, God bless you. <laughs> In fact, God bless you more. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know, that question was still there. How can I know? How can I know that God will keep his promise? What did Abraham know that allowed him to trust God that deeply? There's an answer. There's an answer. It's in Genesis chapter 15. Turn there. You see, God appears to Abraham in a vision. 15 years. 15 years after the initial promise is made. But 10 years before the promise is fulfilled. God takes Abraham outside. And says to Abraham, look up in the sky. And Abraham is like, children, sky. Okay, okay, you know, let me, I'll, I'll look. So he looks up. And God tells Abraham that his offspring will be as many as the stars in the sky. This is a man that does not even have one child. This is a man that 15 years after the promise, no child. And you're telling him to look at the sky, look at the stars, and his offspring will be as many. 
But you know, God does not stop there. God gives him an additional promise in Genesis uh, chapter 15, verse 7. Let's turn there quickly. It says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, he says to God, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Sovereign Lord, how can I know that these things you're saying will come to pass? And, and really, who wouldn't ask God that question after 15 years of waiting? And then God comes and escalates the promise. Somebody says, I will give you $5. They don't give you $5. Then they come back and they say they will give you $1,000. Aren't you going to ask the person, How? The five that you promised you have not done. Now you are adding 995 to it. Just do the five first. That's what we would say, right? So Abraham naturally says to God, I'm sorry, he looked at Sarah and he's like, are you kidding me? Okay, how can I know? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all this to him. He cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. Let me get some. So this is... Just imagine, this is, the, uh, this is what Abraham did. So, imagine, open this for me. Thank you. So, imagine you've got all this meat. Yeah? <laughs> By asking Abraham, can you see the meat? Can you see it? Can you see it now? You see, by asking Abraham to get these things, God was initiating a covenant with Abraham. He was about to sign a binding agreement, a legally binding contract with this man. Now, in ancient times, this kind of agreement where you take the animal and you split it into two was done between two kinds of people. It was usually between a king, a great king, and a lesser king. It was never between two people on equal footing. It was always between one person greater and a subordinate. So the king, a lesser king. The king, his servant. The king and his minister. Amen? Never people on the same level. Amen? Amen. They would slaughter the animals, cut them up like we've cut this one up, and create an aisle between them. Amen? So me come. Pastor Sami. Sami is a, is a pastor in Jesus' house. Amen? But I'm the senior pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want to call him a lesser pastor. Let, let's just call him the junior pastor. Amen? So he's a, he's a lesser pastor. Amen? <laughs> no, 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 no. I take that back. He's, he's the junior pastor. Yeah? So what would happen, right, is once they had the animals split in two, the junior or the lesser would walk in between them, yeah, back and forth. And what that means, what they are saying, is that whoever does not keep the covenant, he would be split in two, like the animals. He would be destroyed, his blood would be shed, like the animals. Now, only the lesser would walk between it. Because, listen, 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 because he dare not ask me, to walk between it. Thank you. Just walk between it. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. Now see what happens. Abraham falls into a deep sleep. And a thick cloud, a terrible darkness, comes over him. And I want you to pay close attention to what happens in Genesis 15. Verse 17 says, When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Hallelujah. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, 
To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Now, do you see what just happened here? God is saying, if I don't, if I, God, don't keep this covenant, if I don't build this nation, may this curse fall on me. God cursed himself. He says, if I, God, don't keep this covenant, may this curse fall on me. And Abraham believed. He took God at his word. And here's the part I hadn't seen before. Did you notice who didn't walk through the pieces? Abraham didn't walk through the pieces. God, the greater, God himself walked through the pieces. While Abraham slept, God said, Abraham, don't worry. Even if you don't keep the covenant, I will keep the covenant. says, even if you are unfaithful, I will be faithful. So, the covenant, the rule, the, 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 the terms of the covenant are not dependent on us. You see, by passing through this split carcass, God was saying, I, I, I am responsible. He says, even when you are not faithful, he says, I, will remain faithful. Amen. You see, this is the God that we serve. Yes. God is saying, even if you fail, I will not fail. Yes. says, if I fail, let it be on me. If Israel fails, let it be on me. May my body be broken in two. May my blood be poured out. And Israel failed in keeping the covenant. Who died? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, yeah. And you think that would be the end of it. But God was not done testing Abraham's faith. He would tell him to go and sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And, and the man obeyed. But God came and he rescued Isaac. 2,000 years later, in the same location, God would sacrifice his only son. Hallelujah. This time, there was nobody to come to the rescue. God would honor the covenant he made with Abraham. And through his son, he extends a covenant to us. A new covenant. Not the covenant of Moses. That is dependent on what we do. But a covenant that says, even if you fail, I will not fail. And like Abraham, we can receive this covenant by faith. Abraham trusted and he obeyed God. And he wasn't afraid to ask God, how can I know? God pointed to this covenant. Say, this is how you know. This is how you know. God placed his very godness, his very deity on the line. And that is why Abraham, the Bible says, against hope, in hope. Against hope, in hope. Because he, I mean, nobody does that. No king does that. That is how far God will go for you. The Bible says he has exalted his word even above his name. This morning, I want us to just take a minute and pray. Let us thank God for the love with which he loved us. You know, God's love is not just about feelings. It is a, a tangible love. It's a, it's a definite love. It's a love that made him give his only son. It is a love that made him initiate a covenant. Let's just thank God for his love. 
Father, this morning we, we thank you and we bless you. Almighty God, we just give you praise. We thank you for the love with which you love us. We thank you for the new covenant which you initiated. Father, we ask that you will grant to each and every one of us to see the benefits of that covenant in our lives. Almighty and ever-living God, we give you praise and we give you glory. We thank you for hope. We thank you for hope. We pray that everybody who came here this morning, who have lost hope, that you will again fill them with hope. As they ask, how shall I know? We pray in the name of Jesus that you will grant to each and every one of them an answer to that prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless you. Hallelujah. And we give you praise. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.